Good morning, Polyphony, and welcome to a new season in August of 2023 here as we begin our uh, new seasons at each of our churches. I'm so glad to see all of you here today and share this time with you, and especially glad to introduce to you our presenter today, Reverend Dr. Justin Addington, serves as the Minister of Music at First Baptist Church of Savannah, Georgia. And Justin holds a BA in music education from Limestone College, a master of church music and choral conducting from Concordia University, Wisconsin, and a doctorate of theology in worship studies from the Robert E. Weber Institute. Having 20 years of experience as a church musician, Justin has also taught music in the public schools, served on boards for several arts related organizations and worked as a musical director and pianist for community and professional theater companies. Today, Justin will offer a timely and practical presentation for us pastoral musicians entitled Rebuilding and Growing a Music Ministry. Justin, welcome. So glad to have you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here and to see some people that I know pretty well and some folks that I hope to get to know. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen with you. And I, uh, I, I'm i not always so great at this kind of stuff. So you may have to bear with me for a moment. We practiced this before we got here, but that doesn't mean anything. Um, okay. Are we there? Can you see that? We're good? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I, I believe so. Yeah. All right. Well, today we're going to be talking about ideas uh, that will aid in rebuilding and growing your music ministry. Um, I, I didn't know my bio was going to be read. So just to give you a little bit uh, about me uh, before we begin, um, I was raised in the United Methodist Church, and I'm a relative newcomer to Baptist life. And I want to extend great thanks to Polyphony because um, I did not know that a, a music uh, colleague organization like Polyphony existed. I was a part of such a thing in my Methodist upbringing, but really felt kind of alone when I came into Baptist life. I knew of the great heritage of music at Ridgecrest and all of that through the Southern Baptist Church, but serving a, a rather unique Baptist congregation, I didn't know what was uh, out there. And when I met uh, Doug, I was introduced to Doug, uh, my whole life changed. And I'm just really grateful uh, for polyphony and for what that means to me. Um, I, like uh, Kyle said, I have 25 years of experience in music ministry. I have served large and small churches like most of you. I have been a part of big programs that had 70 choir members and, and, and staff. And I've been a part of churches that had three people in my choir. So I I can sympathize with, with the spectrum there. And uh, I wanted to point out the fact that uh, I've served seven churches during my career. And four out of those seven churches were uh, situations where I had to rebuild the program. And, you know, I think we all early on kind of do the hard work with the hope that one day we're going to reach that perfect big church job with all the money and all the opportunity. And uh, I'm just humbled and amazed at the ways that God keeps putting at least me in my place and saying, no, uh, I have work for you to do in other ways. And what has actually happened in these situations is that I have developed a passion for rebuilding. And I feel like uh, some of my gifts are in that arena. So um, I give thanks for the places that God has planted me and the work that uh, I've been able to do and hope to still continue to do. Um, <clears throat> just to let you know what we're going to talk about today, um, we're going to talk about, I'm going to break this into five sections. The first is going to be building a vision for your music ministry. The second is going to be getting organized. The third is forming community. The fourth is doing the hard work. And the last, uh, we'll share some repertoire ideas. All right. Now, I want to say that absolutely nothing I'm going to offer today is 
new or original. And you have probably all heard everything that I'm going to say. But if you're anything like me, we absorb all this information when we go to conferences and the like, and we file it away and honestly forget it until somebody may say something or trigger something in our mind or say something in a different way that helps us realize, oh, I could do that in my context or whatever. So that's all I'm hoping to do today is to uh, spark a memory for you or to uh, help uh, facilitate an idea, maybe one that you can share. I encourage you to kind of jot down some notes. If something I say uh, triggers something for you that you want to share with the group, we'll have a time to do that because I really want this to be a time of sharing together from our various experiences, okay? But before we begin, I'd like to offer a familiar prayer for us. O oh God, whom saints and angels delight to worship in heaven, be ever present with your servants who seek through art and music to perfect the praises offered by your people on earth, and grant to them even now glimpses of your beauty and make them worthy at length to behold it unveiled forevermore. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, let's talk about building a vision for your music ministry. I've always thought that um, shared vision is important. We've all worked in churches that have gone through maybe strategic plannings or whatever, and, and it's always so helpful to have people united around a shared idea. And you may think that uh, it it's common sense that, well, we're we're music makers and we're here to praise God. And it's as simple as that. But I feel like we can dive a little deeper and connect with our people in a, a, a stronger way if we're intentional about building a vision. The first thing I would say in your vision building is to make sure that you're always keeping the worship of your congregation as the number one priority. Um, I have a good many colleagues, I'm sure you do too, who do very great work, but over time, it becomes apparent that the performance aspect or the, the, the growth of the program or the number of hits on social media and that type of thing become the priority, and we lose uh, sight of the fact that the main goal of the music ministry is to undergird the praise of God in the church. And um, so I would just encourage you in all ways to ask questions of how does our music ministry and what we do uplift or support the worship of God's people. The second thing I would encourage you to do in building a vision for music ministry is to strive for excellence. I'm a big believer that um, the effort that we put into our work in, in the choirs or ensembles is a direct reflection of our commitment to God. And I work really hard to try to help my choir members understand that their commitment here is a way of committing and giving to God. And uh, it takes a while to make that turn for some people, but once you do, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And my gosh, it helps attendance too, which never hurts at all. Um, but I'll also say that in your striving for excellence, I view excellence as giving your best. It doesn't mean that it's perfection. Um, that's not something we attain on this uh, side of the pond. And so uh, we have to have a graceful heart in, in striving for that excellence. I would also encourage you to be the best you you can be. Uh, many times we see churches or music directors trying to be something that they're not. Um, I have I actually served in a context where my predecessor had very specific ideas about what music in the church should be, and they made the music of the church their music rather than the music that the congregation desired. And it, over a long period of time, really ended up being detrimental to the church as a whole. And so if your church if you have musicians in your church that are good bluegrass musicians and they have a heart for Southern gospel, live into that and make it the absolute best it can be. Uh, don't try to make a Southern gospel church into an Anglican cathedral choir. It's just not going to work. Um, and that may mean <laughs> that we have to have some sacrifices on our end of things that we like as directors, but um, it's really not about us. And sometimes we need reminding of that. 
Uh, I want to encourage you to be creative as you build your vision for ministry. And I put COVID there in parentheses because COVID gave us the greatest opportunity in the world to be creative. Uh, it was a it was a pain because we were having to go through difficult times and work harder than we'd ever had to work in the past. But we had the opportunity to do quartets and octets and sing outside and sing in a circle in our sanctuary spaced out and do all of these creative things that we had we knew we could do, but we were afraid to before. And the the one of the blessings that came out of COVID was that it opened our congregation's eyes and minds to new forms of expression and worship. And I think we now have the freedom to try things that we may have been afraid to try before uh, because of the pandemic. So um, be, be creative in the ways that you formulate your program. Um, I want to encourage people to honor the history of your program. Um, one of the things, I'm just speaking for me personally, one of the things that has been a success for me was to involve past music directors that are still in the area uh, to renovate a historic instrument, uh, you know, maybe hang a portrait gallery in the choir room of the choir through the years or the music directors that have served the church through the years, just to remind people of their past and to give them something to be proud of. I've seen far too many colleagues, especially younger colleagues, that go in and want to just make everything their own, and they almost erase the history of everything that came before them. And that's just, it sets folks up for disaster, and it it's not a very pastoral way to approach your work. Um, I So I, I encourage people to honor the history, and I think it's a way to really in, endear yourself to your congregation, to let them know that you're stepping on this into this journey with them rather than trying to take them in a totally different direction. Once you formulate a, a vision of music ministry, whatever that may be, I encourage you to write it down and make it visible. Um, churches that I've served in the past, we've formulated a vision for music ministry. We put it on our website. We put it on the front of our choir manuals. We put it uh, I even saw one church, not mine, but one church took a phrase from their uh, music ministry vision and had it calligraphied on the wall around their, the ceiling of their choir room so that the choir could be reminded at all times what they were doing and what they were about. Um, and don't forget to get input. Um, as you formulate a, sir, a, a vision of music ministry, I would encourage you to use your choir officers, your music ministry committee, worship committee, uh, uh, or surveys, maybe get input from the people in your church so that you can learn who they are, what they value, what brings them to the table, um, because it's their ministry. You, you've you been given charge as a shepherd, but it's really theirs and, um, that you're taking care of here. All right, um, let's talk about organization for a moment. I believe that uh, in order for ministries to function well, they need to be organized. Um, there is some beauty in creative chaos, but uh, it doesn't always work effectively as a, a mode of operation for, for the long term. First of all, I would encourage communication, communication with your choir members, with your pastoral leaders. Uh, just make sure that those doors are open. We as musicians tend to, just because of the, wor the world we live in, we operate on islands unto ourselves sometimes. And uh, even times when we think we're collaborating, we're really not. And uh, so I just encourage you to make sure that communication is a priority. Um, one way that I have done that in the past with my choir is to keep them constantly aware of what's going on in the ministry. Uh, one of the larger churches I served had a weekly choir newsletter where we had pastoral concerns, birthday announcements, uh, pictures from choir members. I mean, it was a it was a pain to do. It was a lot of work, but it really uh, helped that ensemble. And there were multiple ensembles that used the same newsletter. Um, my program here at First Baptist isn't really big enough to warrant something like that. So I just send my choir a weekly email that lets them know what's going on. We also created a private Facebook group for the choir where they're able to share prayer requests. Um, I'm able to send pictures or announcements quickly that I want to get out quicker than they may read their emails. 
So just look for creative uh, ways to communicate. Uh, I accompany a high school choir in the area and they use the WhatsApp thing that our polyphony cohort actually uses that. But um, I have to turn it off because when you're in a, a, a group chat with 150 high schoolers, it, it's like all the time. And um, I'm not saying you do that with your choir, but there are creative ways to keep in touch. So do whatever works for you. Um, plan, 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 plan. It's not our favorite thing to do, but it is the most important thing that we have to do. Um, especially those of us that serve, um, that may serve as bivocational uh, music people uh, it, and, and they're not afforded the luxury of spending all day in an office to plan, uh, getting your ducks in a row and having a plan, uh, a long-term plan for your music is extremely important, I believe, to your own personal sanity, but um, also for the health of your ensemble. I tend to plan by semester. I'll do long range planning of big things. Like I've already picked out my big Easter program for next year, um, but I've not picked out my anthems for Lent or anything like that. But I have already planned uh, my entire fall through, through Epiphany for my choir. And I do that um, to keep myself on track, but I also do it to hold them accountable because my choir members over time have become good about the fact that if they notice that a big anthem's happening on a certain day, they'll plan around it, um, the more involved and dedicated they become. So um, I also feel that it, it filters out in other ways. Choir members are like, I used to teach school, and so they, they're like students. They sniff out when you're not prepared, and they don't tend to respect or give you as much as they normally would if they figure out that you're flying by the seat of your pants. Um, I realize sometimes we can't do better than that, but um, we we are about the work of God. We do handle things that are holy and they deserve um, our, our best attention. Uh, I mentioned this before, but I would encourage you to have some type of a choir manual that uh, spells out for your choir members what's expected of them when they join how they need to get in touch with you, what uh, the rehearsal schedule is, what they're expected to wear, they expected to dry clean their own robes, all of this thing. Uh, I stepped into a church that I served for about eight years and they had, it was a book. I mean, it was a big choir manual that had all kinds of policies and in the back it had a photo directory of the choir and that was a lot. So uh, my choir that I serve right now, we have one page <laughs> of, of bulleted points that's, that let folks know what's expected of them and, and what it's like to be in the choir. If you would like to see that, it's nothing grand or glorious, but it is on the, the First Baptist of Savannah's music page. If you go there, you can find our, our choir information sheet. But it's just helpful to choir members to know what's expected of them. Um, it's also a way to show them that you, you're you serious and, and that you care about the work that you're doing and that you expect them to do the same. Uh, the rehearsal space, it's kind of an, an unspoken thing that choir rooms across America are the nastiest, dis, most disorganized places on the planet. And they really shouldn't be. Um, some people thrive in, in chaos. I'm not one of those people. But I really believe the rehearsal space should be clean. It should be organized. It should smell pleasant. It should have good lighting and space and all that. And those are things we don't often think of. Um, I, I had a, a, a church I served one time where the choir room was in the basement. And uh, it was always damp. And there was mold growing on the ceiling and all this stuff. And my choir members didn't want to come to rehearsal because they didn't feel safe to sing praise to God. So, um, you know, think about some things that that you may over time uh, not even notice. Uh, look, look at your space with fresh eyes. Um, I've always tried to have like a choir member intake form to help me get organized. I used to do this as a as a written thing that they would fill out, but I've now. Uh, my administrative assistant here has has brought me into the modern era, and we now do a Google form, which I had to learn how to use. 
Um, but when choir members, and that's actually on our website as well, if you want an example, when new choir members join, just have them fill out this form that gives you all the information you may think you would ever need, including like their shirt size, just in case you're going to go on a choir tour at some point and need a shirt uh, size. But I also ask them questions like, what's your favorite anthem? What's your favorite hymn? And I can't tell you how many times that has been useful when one of my choir members has died and the family had no clue where to start planning music for their service. And I was able to go to that form and say, I have some suggestions here direct from the, the person's mouth. So um, just things to help us stay organized and together. Um, rehearsal tracks. Um, if these things used to be uh, huge uh, time consuming things to provide rehearsal aids for your choir, but it's become easier and easier and easier these days. A lot of publishers will um, provide these. Of course, they cost a little bit. If you've got the time, you can make them yourselves. But I've been impressed, especially with the uh, more classical pieces if that you may do, like a, if you were going to do a movement for Messiah at Christmas, all of those choruses are out on YouTube with soprano part alone, alto part alone. And I will send an email to my choir and say, you know, I noticed you had some trouble with this section of this. I found this might help you spend some, a few minutes with it uh, before rehearsal next week and see if it helps you at all. And folks really tend to respond well to that. Um, it amazes me. I, I serve a very historic church. We've just been kind of doing some culling of our music library, and we're throwing out pieces of music with copyright dates from the 1880s, <laughs> which just is hilarious to me. Um, my church used to have a paid solo quartet, as was fashionable in southern cities, and then they moved into a, a volunteer choir mode in the 20s. And we've been looking at the music that the choir did in the 20s, and it was amazing to me. It was hard music that I would never attempt to do with my choir now. But that's because our, our lives have changed. It used to be that music and a, a part-time endeavor like a choir was all that people had to do. And now we're competing for their time. Mm -hmm. And so anything that we can give them, we can... Uh, provide to help them make the rehearsal process easier, I think is a is a big help. Um, and the last thing I'll say, uh, I mentioned that we uh, created a private Facebook group for my choir. One thing that I've started doing on Wednesday nights is I live stream my rehearsal in that private Facebook group. I set my phone on top of the piano and I just record the rehearsal. And um, it's it's been a really good thing to keep my choir members accountable because, um, you know, it used to just be you got a text from a choir member that said, I'm sick, I won't be there tonight. And you just had to roll your eyes and know that they were probably going to be out celebrating their birthday or something at a Mexican restaurant. Um, but now I'm able to say, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I look forward to seeing you on the live stream tonight. <laughs> And it's it's been a great way to help um, choir members be intentional about attending rehearsals. So sometimes you have to be a little sneaky with these with these people we call Christians. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about community for a moment. Um, I uh, believe that a choir that loves one another and enjoys being together uh, sings better. Uh, we have, I, I know this is going out public on the internet, so I have to be careful about what I say. We have a choir here in Savannah that is comprised mostly of professional singers. They are the top notch group of uh, all of the best of the best of our city. And I've been to several of their programs and their concerts, and it's just, it's amazing. But when I sit and I close my eyes and listen to that group, there is something missing from the sound of that group. And in my mind and in my opinion, it's a heart of ministry and a heart for loving one another because this group comes in, they're all professionals, they know their music, they have one rehearsal before the service and they sing, then they go home and they don't talk to each other again until the next time they have to be at their gig. 
So I, I really believe even if we don't have the best choirs in the world, there's something beautiful that happens in our music making and in the way we convey a message to the congregation that's very special. But I believe that that comes through a sense of community and uh, we can do a lot to help foster that. The first thing would be make sure you have opportunities for your choir to have fellowship. Um, I work really hard so that my choir knows that their fellowship time is not in the middle of my rehearsal when I'm switching between pieces of music. Um, so I've worked with choirs that would come early, that would maybe you had a choir table at the fellowship dinner in the fellowship hall, or I actually served uh, a Methodist church. It wasn't a Baptist church. Uh, the, the, the men of the choir, they went to the bar across the street from the church and had beer after rehearsal on Wednesdays. Um, so, you know, you have to be creative about fellowship, but it's, um, it's, it's very important for your group to, uh, to have opportunities to be together. Uh, I once served a church where the choir had fellowship after rehearsal, um, and the choir director before me was a baker and always baked cookies and pies to bring to rehearsal. And they asked me in my interview if I was going to do that, like that was a precursor for the job. I, I sorely just, I got the job, but I never, I never brought cookies to rehearsal. Um, figure out special events for your choir to do. Uh, uh, I've been a part of churches that had like a Halloween party for the choir every year and the choir would come in costumes and they would theme it up like some years it was composers or some years they came dressed as their favorite anthem and they had to do like all kind of crazy stuff whatever you want to do but just find opportunities for your people to be the the first thing I mentioned fellowship I think it's neat for choir members to fellowship outside of organized group things I love to see uh, choir ladies going out to lunch and whatever, but it's good to do it as a group. And I offer that Halloween thing or a Christmas party, whatever it be, um, as an option. This past year, my choir, uh, we prepared a, a big, heavy Christmas program. And then uh, for our Christmas party, uh, I invited uh, my choir and other musicians in town to my home. And we sat around the piano and sang through John W. Peterson's Night of Miracles as our Christmas party. So it, <laughs> it was a way for them to have something fun and musical to do, but it, it didn't take a lot of, of, of thought. It was uh, something enjoyable for them. Um, I strongly encourage choir retreats to start off your season. Uh, if you haven't done this before, I encourage you to give it a try. I used to be a part of churches that would go out of town. They like went to the beach or went to the mountains to do the choir retreat. I personally am not finding that as successful anymore since the pandemic. Um, my folks are just doing like an, an all day Saturday thing at the church. I would encourage you to bring in a guest conductor. Uh, use your friends from Polyphony to, to bring in somebody to work with your choir. Um, I use it to let my choir get a head start on pieces of music that are a little more difficult. We do some sectional work, but I also bring in a conductor to work with them on basic choral concepts because, you know, for whatever reason, your choir believes it when other people say the same things you've been saying all the time. Um, we're really lucky this year at First Baptist. Um, we have Anna Laura Page coming to be our guest clinician at our retreat in early September. She's also going to do a, uh, a hymn festival with us while she's here. I, I am bragging about that because my church normally doesn't have the funds or the connections to get somebody like her to come, but she so happens to just be a best friend of one of my altos, and she volunteered to come, and I was like, yes, ma'am, bring it on, so we're really looking forward to that, but um, you never know what connections you may have. Um, I encourage you to have a music ministry Sunday in your church. Um I grew up uh, United Methodist, and we have a wonderful liturgy in our book of worship for rededicating individuals to the ministry of music for the year. And I've done that service at retreats with communion, but um, I really think that it's more powerful when it's done in the context of the worshiping community so that the congregation can affirm the gifts of the music ministry and vow to support and uphold them for the year. Um Choir tours. If you've not done some choir tours, I encourage you to do that. They're great opportunities for fellowship. And trust me, if you, you don't know how to love your fellow church people until you travel with them. Um, and, but that can be anything. I, I've 
been privileged to do several overseas tours, but you can also do things locally. Um, if, if you have a larger church choir, go sing a couple of Sunday evening concerts for the smaller churches in your area. It doesn't have to be big things, but just opportunities for your people to make music in different places. And it, it can be a type of mission too. Um, oh, go sing in nursing homes if you have homebound members. Also, go Christmas caroling at Christmas time. Whatever gets your people singing outside. I put Salvation Army on here because one year I saw this advertised in a handbell magazine. I got my handbell choir to go and ring for the Salvation Army. Rather than just one ringer, we had a quartet ring music with no tables, just a music stand. And it was great fun to say we were ringing for the Salvation Army. Although I never did it again because I heard a gentleman when he, when he passed by us say, if the Salvation Army can afford those kind of ringers, we're not we're not going to give them any money. And uh, so um, I, I, I thought it was a great idea, but I don't know that it was uh, fiscally uh, responsible for the Salvation Army. Pastoral care. Um, let your singers or your instrumentalists in your music ministry know that you care about them. Check in on them when they're going through difficult times. Have a time of sharing in your rehearsals for prayer concerns, etc. Make sure that people know that you understand that what you're doing is about more than just making music together. I'm surprised I even have to say this, but um, please pray at your rehearsals <laughs> with your people. I'm amazed at the amount of colleagues that do not do this. Um, set the tone for your rehearsals, whether at the beginning or at the end. Uh, I personally tend to read scripture at the front at the front end of my rehearsal. I, I read a psalm and then I pray and have prayer concerns at the end of rehearsal. But it's important to put uh, your music making in the context of people's spiritual journeys. Um, as a sense of community, I would encourage you to involve people. Let people um, do things. You know, I have some... Uh, I don't want to call them busybodies, but I have some some little church ladies that love to be involved. And if you put them in charge of filing the music or you put them in charge of making sure everybody has a choir robe, you know, it's number one, things you don't have to worry about. And number two, there are uh, ways to get people involved. And I once heard somebody say that a, a, a thriving music ministry can operate fully in the absence of its director. And I think there's there's some wisdom in that to making sure that things are covered that that you don't have to be involved in. Uh, elect some choir officers to to take on some responsibilities. Not only can they help take attendance or be section leaders, uh, they can also keep up with the pastoral needs of your choir and report them back to you. Anything to involve people and take the load off of you. Community can also be built by keeping music in alive in the life of the church. Encourage the singing of hymns in Sunday school classes in your church. Encourage the singing of the doxology at your Wednesday fellowship meals. Anything that can help people see music doesn't have to just be reserved for the 11 o'clock worship hour. And then oftentimes when we're rebuilding a program, um, healing is needed as a part of that. And pastoral care goes hand in hand with that. And you may have to be intentional about the way you approach your work. Um, I have served in two contexts where my predecessor was fired for one reason or another, and that left the choir really wounded, and they needed some some help kind of getting over that. And believe it or not, uh, I can count in my memory more than one rehearsal where we didn't sing at all, where we had times of sharing and and healing. Um, and sometimes that's needed. All right, let's talk about the work you can do to make this happen. First of all, work with your colleagues. Uh, I, I mentioned before, music ministers tend to operate on their own. Don't do that. Work with your, your staff. Work with your colleagues in the community. Join your churches together to do things that you couldn't do on your own. Um, uh, COVID helped us realize that we are uh, stronger together. So take advantage of those opportunities. Participate in continuing education, which you're doing right now, continually getting new ideas. Show your people you care. Um, I, I know that it, we're aware that there are people in our world and in our profession that do this simply as a gig, 
But if you want your music ministry to grow, if you want it to thrive, they're only going to give you what you put into it. So let them know that you're just as invested in this as they are. Study the texts and the history of the pieces of music that you're uh, putting in front of your choir. I admit that I and busy, and I sometimes will just pass out a favorite anthem and say, oh, we know this, it's not going to be a big deal. And then there's always that one choir member that will raise their hand and say, Justin, tell us what this text right here on page three is trying to convey. And of course, you've not looked at it, and you really have no clue. And the particular church that I serve has a good many retired clergy in it. I've got four retired ordained clergy in my choir. And there's been more than one time where I've stood there feeling like a complete idiot because I had not done the prep work for rehearsal. So do yourself a favor there. Do devotions in your rehearsals. Um, if, if there's a special spiritual nugget that can be gleaned from one of your anthems, prepare a, a small sermon in the middle of your rehearsal to break things up. Or teach a Sunday school class. I had a church once that the choir wanted to do a little more in-depth study but they didn't feel they could be a part of a Sunday school class because they had to leave early to go to choir. So we started a choir Sunday school class and had a short lesson every Sunday before rehearsal. And that, that proved to be something really special. Involve children in the life of your music ministry and, and in your worship. Uh, I serve a church that's kind of rebirthing itself after the pandemic, and we don't have a lot of children. I don't have enough children to have a children's choir. But if a child is studying piano or violin or they want to be an acolyte or read scripture, we involve them in as many ways as we can. I actually have teenagers singing in my choir because we don't have enough to have a youth choir. And it's breathed new life into our adult choir. So, again, be creative here. Recruit. The music ministry is not going to grow itself, okay? And just putting an ad in your church newsletter isn't going to cut it. You've got to do some hard work. Uh, we do a summer choir here at First Baptist for June, July, and August, and we allow people to sign up and uh, just show up and sing with us. We do a quick rehearsal on Sunday. We don't wear robes. The anthem is very flexible. Um, and we always end up gaining a couple of members from the summer choir experience. So I encourage you to do something like that. Um, you may also want to do a special choir for Christmas cantatas and that type of thing. People tend to respond well to that. Um, I would encourage you to write letters or write handwritten cards to people that you hear. If a choir, if a congregant comes and says, this person's got a good voice, I go, I go to my desk immediately, write their name down, and on Monday morning, I write them a card that says, it's great to have you in worship. I hear that you're a singer. We'd love to talk to you about joining our choir. You've just got to be intentional about it. I've also been known to um, harass people until they just give in and say yes, and you know, sometimes you have to do what you can. Call people, send them just a text, whatever works, and take them to coffee. Get to know people, let them know who you are, and they'll want to be a part of your program. I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'm, I'm hurrying here. Sorry. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about are some repertoire ideas. Um, make sure you give your choirs a well-balanced diet of things that make them feel good, things that provide them a little bit of work, and then things that really stretch them. I tend to only do like one stretchy piece a semester because my choir can really dive into it over a long period of time. There's nothing worse than a choir being constantly made to feel like they're not reaching the mark. They tend to start to shut down. They don't give all that they can. So make sure you're not planning three hard anthems back to back in your schedule. You know, uh, balance it out to where they have some opportunity for a, a mental or a musical sorbet, if you will, in their diet of repertoire. Variety is the spice of life. So make sure that you're not doing all the same type of music all the time. The church that I serve now uh, did a, a heavy repertoire of, of mostly classical music prior to my arrival. And um, while they were proud of that identity, it kind of got them in a rut. So I've been throwing in, you know, some global hymns and things like that that have really have been received well. Now, we still do a healthy diet of the stuff that they're accustomed to, but um, it's not the same old, same old all the time. Just heard my secretary sneeze down the hall. Um, whatever you do, do it well. 
Um, I've worked with so many uh, choir directors over the years that have an idea of what their choir should be. So they make them sing all this hard repertoire just because they think it's the thing. And then the choir gets up on Sunday morning and they they do not produce the anthem successfully. The, the congregations out there covering their eyes and wishing that the moment would end. And what you've done in that moment to fulfill your musical standards or your desires is to detract from the worship of God for the people in the pews. Um, when I was in college, there was this little lady that served the Presbyterian Church in the town where I went to, to school, and she was a well-respected musician, and she uh, was a retired professor of music, and she had this little choir of about six people, and she made them sing hard classical masterworks all the time, and they had this reputation for just being the most pitiful little thing, but by guppy, they were gonna sing those standards because that's what they needed to do, and um, you, you just have to look at the big picture sometimes. Now, with that being said, make sure that you do give your choir the opportunity to sing some choral standards, even if you think they're outside of their uh, ability. Uh, every choir in the world, even if they have to work at it for a year, can sing in Latin or English Mozart's Ave Verum, and they will feel successful at doing that um, and feel like they're entering into the realm of music history and the music of the grand the greater church, something that's bigger than themselves. I think that's healthy. Uh, some resources I want to make sure you're aware of. If you don't use IMSLP, do it. You can get all of the big classical masterworks for free and print them off and save you money. Um, the St. James Press is my best friend. I use the St. James Press all the time. It's uh, heavily geared toward Anglican worship, but they have some good things that are available for uh, your average church choirs, but it's music with integrity that's unison, two-part, maybe some four-part, and that's what I use all the time during the summer because I have a choir that arrives without me knowing who's going to show up, so they're anthems that are flexible, and I appreciate that. Use your hymnal. Um, sometimes the hymnal is the best gift we've been given. Um, I know as a United Methodist, when the, the 89 hymnal was put together, they intentionally crafted that so that there were things in there that were anthems for choirs, not for congregation. So use your hymnal. But you can also create beautiful anthems uh, just by giving your sopranos a verse, your, your altos a verse, letting a verse be four part a cappella. You can be really creative just by using the hymn book. I'm going to show you this. A few years back, the Mormon Tabernacle put out a series of books called Hymnal Plus where the organist has a really fancy introduction. It divvies the stanzas up among the choir, and then the organ has a descant to play underneath the final stanza. All the choir has to look at is the hymn book, but the organist and the conductor have something to elevate it a little bit, and it's really nice for times where you're in a crunch or have low numbers or whatever. And lastly, since we're uh, mostly CBF folks here, I wanna encourage you to look at Celebrating Grace. Uh, the resources that they put out, especially their children's choir curriculums, are, are really wonderful. So take advantage of that. All right. Um, just before we stop, I want to share four of my favorite anthems with you uh, that maybe you can use. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, the first one is Be Joyful Together. It's a two-part setting of a Bach cantata movement by Hal Hopson. Um, it's printed by Al uh, Alfred. And it has general and Easter texts, uh, parts for B flat or C instruments. It's an anthem that sounds a lot harder than it is. So if your choir is looking to be successful at singing some classical music, but you don't feel like they can handle some big work, I strongly recommend that. That anthem can be learned in one rehearsal. It's perfect for the Sunday after Easter when you want something big and joyful, but you don't have, you know that all your forces are going to be gone. Good Christian friends, uh, oh, I, I titled it wrong. I'm sorry. It's good Christians all rejoice, not good Christian friends rejoice. I'll fix that. Um, this is a two-part anthem by Anna Laura Page based on the In Dulce Jubilo uh, tune, but it's written with handbells and a B-flat trumpet. It's very joyful, kind of echoing back and forth. It's perfect for the Sunday after Christmas or the Sunday after Easter. It's a one rehearsal wonder. Um, 
and sounds a lot harder than it is. I, so I love these two because they provide an opportunity for joyful music on Sundays where you're really struggling because your people are away after a big holiday. Um, this is available from the St. James Press. This is the Puccini Requiem. It's a five minute dramatic work, mostly for unison choir with some divisi, organ and viola. Uh, so it's available for free on the St. James Press. It's great for All Saints Day. I've done it like as a choral prelude to an All Saints service. Um, and your choir feels really great because they go around telling people, oh, we're singing a requiem for All Saints Day. But in reality, they're singing a unison piece of music. So, um, And lastly, my fav one of my favorite anthems is Come Ye Disconsolate by Terry Johnson. It's a, it's a more difficult piece, I would say, uh, for your average church choir, but it's it's well worth the work, and I just think it's a lovely setting. I would also encourage you to look at the works of Matt Wilberg. He's the conductor of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Most of his anthems are in unison uh, with lush writing and accompaniments, and they sound a lot harder than they really are, and I've list listed some of my favorites here. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, Love Divine, Be Still. My choir is actually singing that Be Still this Sunday uh, to go along with the gospel text and the lectionary. And my shepherd will supply my need and saints bound for heaven. I don't know if this presentation, if I can send the PDF out after it's done with the links live or whatever, but I'll try to make sure there's a way for you to get that. Um, that's all I have. I talked longer than I meant to. I'm sorry about that. Um, but that concludes my presentation. I want to thank you for your time. I hope that you've Something has sparked in your memory, and I hope you have some ideas that you'll be able to share with the group uh, in our post-presentation discussion. So thank you. Thank you, Justin. This has been very inspiring <clears throat> to this uh, session. Thank you so much for all your work, putting it together. I'll uh, close with this benediction for those gathered here and for those watching this later. Friends and partners in ministry, may the creator of all who calls you to be co-creators in a new creation on this earth, empower you to create after the pattern of Jesus and in the ever dancing of the spirit. May the blessing and love of God, our maker, savior and sustainer be with you in your work and in your homes this day and forevermore. Amen. Breathe, bless and be well.